All right. So if you take a look, right? If you take a look at the um, how, what's going on. Do you guys want to turn the light off in the back, or at least turn one of the lights off? When you take a look at what's going on with um, with the relationship between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland and then other organs. I like to draw it as boxes, all right, because they're circles, diamonds, triangles, whatever. So this is the hypothalamus. We'll go ahead and use the anterior pituitary gland because of the question you asked, okay? And then in this case, this is going to be the adrenal gland, all right, because you asked about CT or um, ACTH. So what happens is, is that there's a blood supply connecting right, connecting these, and there's also a nerve tract, which we usually draw in yellow. Nerves are just usually drawn in yellow, all right? Now, when you talk about what hormones are released from here, these are always going to be RH or IH, okay, always. So that's why I said you could, just, you could change the letter. So you asked about CRH, right? So CRH is corticotropin releasing hormone, okay? That RH or IH always tells you it's released from the hypothalamus, and it always tells you it's a hormone made and secreted from the hypothalamus, which means if we're talking about secretion, that means it's going into the space. It's getting out of the cell, which means it has to travel in some way. So it has to travel down that blood supply, the portal system. Okay, and the target of the portal system is always the anterior pituitary gland. So that hormone talks to cells in the anterior pituitary gland, and it says, release. Right, and it tells, and the, the first letter tells you what it's telling it to release. So corticotropin, right? And time you see the word tropin or tropic, anytime you see these words, right, they tell you that they're going to stimulate another gland. Right, that's usually what that word means. So corticotropin. Is gonna tropin tells me it's gonna stimulate something, and what's cortico tell me? Cortisol, right? Cortex. Cortisol's name because it's released by the adrenal cortex, right? So cortico is referring to the adrenal cortex specifically, right? Which, from the name of the hormone released from the anterior pituitary gland, right? So there's a blood supply leaving the anterior pituitary gland, right? This hormone is ACTH, adrenocorticotropin. Hormone. Right? So this C is referring to this C. Right? That's, it, it, if you, that's why abbreviations are okay, but if you know the names, they'll tell you a lot more about what's happening. So adrenocorticotropin hormone, right, talks to the adrenal cortex. And it says stimulate. And it really stimulates, right, um, cortisol. Right? But it also will talk to the medulla and it'll secrete um, adrenaline. Right? Both of which are respond respond to stress. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And we see that same relationship. Again, you can change the letters as much as you like. Right? I could call it growth hormone releasing hormone. Right? And what would that be? Growth hormone oops, growth hormone releasing hormone. I don't know what's called. GH. Right? G H R H. And who would be released here? GH. GH, which would then talk to the liver as a gland, because right, tropin tells us it talks to a gland, right? But then all, you know, bone, muscle, eventually all the cells. And you're going to get into these if you if you've taken a look at the syllabus, you probably have noticed that there's a there's an endocrine collaborative project with 100 points week 15, right? Thyroid hormone, growth hormone. Adrenaline, cortisol, right? So those are all hormones that are involved that are your choices for that. So we just don't talk about it here. We make you tell us about it and tell your classmates about it. Is norepinephrine also released from the adrenal cortex? Uh, no, I think norepinephrine is actually released from the medulla. Mm. Yeah, because it's a cousin of adrenaline, mm. yeah. which is noradrenaline. Yeah. So um, things that are released from the portal. Do they travel around the body? Or they Good question. Yes. Right? Because blood goes everywhere. Once you put something into the blood supply, it goes everywhere. Agree? So even if I put it into the blood supply, I step on something, and it gets into my blood, 
It can go anywhere, right? That's how you get infections of the brain from stepping on a rusty nail, right? So how is it that if I put something in the blood supply, it's the portal system, right, which is kind of a unique set of connected capillaries, but it doesn't mean it's unconnected from the, from the heart at all. If I put CRH into the blood, how do I make sure that it only talks into your pituitary gland? So who has the receptors? Only the pituitary gland. But yeah, if I were to take blood from my toe, I would see CRH in it. All right? But is my toe capable of responding to it? No. Right, so that, I mean, that's the key here, right? The endocrine system is systemic, but only the cells with the receptor can respond. So it doesn't matter that CRH is in there and it's in the brain and it's in my, you know, stomach or it's in my intestine. It doesn't matter because the only place it's going to have receptors is the anterior pituitary gland. Now, what about growth hormone? All right, what about growth hormone? There's color receptors everywhere, right? Because who responds to it? Who's the target? Bone, muscle, fat, liver. Okay, so that's why those receptors, understanding what's going on with receptors is important. Okay, are there any other questions on that? Okay. Now, last time we were talking about how we regulate hormone secretion, right? And we talked at length about non-hormonal, non-neuronal. Right? Okay, that was our example of insulin and glucagon, right? In response to glucose. What is glucose? What is type of sugar? Mono. It's a monosaccharide. All right, so it's important to recognize it's a monosaccharide. Yes, it's a sugar, but it's really a monosaccharide. All right, it's the, right, capitalized, the monosaccharide. Okay, so if one way to regulate hormone secretion is non-hormonal, non-hormonal, what do you think are the other ways? Neuronal and hormonal. We just talked about hormonal regulation. Because what causes the release of ACTH? No? What causes directly the release of ACTH? Oh, CRH. Another hormone. What causes the release of CRH? Stress. 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 Now, how do you know you're stressed? What makes you stressed? The environment. The environment. How do you know what's going on in your environment? Uh, well, we a little bit, a little bit more generalistic. Eyes, okay. ears. No. What do we call all that type of input? Sensory. Sensory, right? Which is parts of the what body? What system? Sensory. Nerves. Nerves. So, in this slide, thank you very much, we have now actually talked about the other two methods. Because we already know hormonal, CRH, ACTH. Growth hormone releasing hormone. Growth hormone. TRH. TSH. Any of the releasing hormone to the anterior pituitary gland is a perfect example of a hormonal regulation of hormone secretion. Because what causes the release of those hormones from my anterior pituitary gland? Other hormones. That's all it's saying. Okay, you can use any of those as an example. Any of them. To be fully accepted. Now, in terms of the neuronal, I just have to add a little something in here. Color. Oh, my battery's going out. Is I say, huh, some sort of a sensory input, like stress, given our example, right? So we have sensory input. There's a T there. Stress. Sensory input into the brain which then feeds into the hypothalamus, which regulates fear response, all right, and stress reactions, all right? And we say, hey, okay, the hypothalamus is going to say, hey, okay, now I'm going to release CRH. So here you have the nervous system regulating the hormone system, all right? Do you remember when we started talking about the differences between and similarities between nervous system and endocrine? Yeah. They regulate each other. They talk to each other. So neuronal regulation of hormonal secretion is an example of how they regulate each other, how they talk to each other. 
Right? So, the, you know, so if you take a look at that, so if you go to the PowerPoint and take a look at those examples, <coughs> you'll see exactly that. Right? So here's our stressor exercise. Right? That can talk to either CRH or, or uh, CRH or a and then ACTH. Here they're showing us. Right? They're showing us going through the, the sympathetic nervous system. Right, so there, so we can do it a couple of ways because remember the nervous system is what, fast or slow, fast. 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 All right, so this is going to be fast. Let's get some adrenaline and norepinephrine out there. Yeah. Right, but then chronically, right? If I'm long term, long term, right? If I, I, I was thinking of stress, like you know, if I'm, um, I, seeing a cop on the road when you're speeding is always the example I think of. Right, you're, like, ah! right now if he's chasing me. Right? I, this is not going to do it for very long. Right? That's going to really, and that's going to pick up CRH and ACTH. Okay? So you could actually add that into the slide if you like. So it's like the hormone part of it, like when you're stressed for like a couple weeks, because you have like a big test or something coming yeah. up, and then you, you'll start like breaking out. Or like right. Exactly. Exactly. So keep in mind that the regulation of the body is on a continuum. So the immediate responses to say stress are usually by the nervous system. All right? You see something, you see a cough, you get told you have a test in two weeks, and you just go, your heart heart rate speeds up, then they're like, okay, but it's two weeks away. But then you start thinking about it, and now you get that long-term stress. And that's where the, the like you said, the endocrine system starts to pick up and say, it's not time to relax yet. No, no, no. All right? And so it's going to continue the stress response for days or weeks or even months. Yeah, that's exactly. It. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of interweaving of the communications between the two systems. All right. So notice here you have your sympathetic nervous system talking to the adrenal gland. Who else talks to the adrenal gland? How else does the adrenal gland get messages? If not from the nervous system, from the endocrine system, which means the blood. All right, from the blood. All right. So you could add in that CRH information here. So if the stimulus, the stress with stimulus uh -huh. is um, ongoing, then it will continue to be ongoing neural yes. regulation. Yeah, but you know, keep in mind that neuro, nervous system isn't just about what's out here. Right? So I don't actually have to see the cop. So it could be perceived. Yeah, it could be from what's going on in here. Right? Which is her example of, right, if I'm thinking about my test. So you're not looking at your book necessarily. Mm -hmm. But in your head, you're always thinking about it. You're like, oh my gosh, you know, you're working. I have to study for my test. Am I going to have time tonight? I don't know. Cause, and you're not to stress you guys out. <laughs> but I mean, so keep in mind that when we talk about when we talk about nervous system input, it doesn't have to be what's out here, right? Definitely, what's going on in here is also an impact, right? So if you have constant stress, yes, and the endocrine system takes over. Start to other Absolutely. Yeah, cortisol suppresses the immune system, which is why when you're stressed, you get sick more often. Right? It stimulates the sebaceous glands, which is why you often get acne, sweat glands. Because the theory, the theory behind it is, is if you're stressed, you're probably, you're probably um, preparing for activity. I mean, stress in the in the classic evolutionary sense is what? Running from a lion, yeah. you know, or from you know the caveman next door or whatever, right? So you're sweating a lot, right? Because you're trying to get rid of excess heat. You know, so you can think about the physiological responses of that. But yeah. How long is the hormone? It depends. Some hormones are relatively short-lived. Like the, we're going to talk about hormone chemistry in just a second. So some of them are relatively short-lived, like on the, hour, of the order of, you know, half an hour to you know, a day or so, and some of them are really long-lived, like days, weeks, or months, All right? So we're going to actually look at that persistence on the continuum in just a second. Okay, so hormonal, here you can see they're using TRH and TSH and thyroid hormone. Okay, please do note, by the way, just to give it a slide, that when we talk about hormonal regulation of hormones, or for that matter, neuronal, it's important, we always think about it as, you know, Growth hormone, releasing hormone, causes the stimulation of growth hormone. Right? It's always about turning it on, turning it on, turning it on. 
this slide shows us that sometimes hormones can be regulated by being turned down. Right? So here you see TRH from the hypothalamus causing the stimulation releasing hormones, which tells you what it does, causing the release of TSH, right? Thyroid stimulating hormone. What do you think that's going to do to the thyroid gland? Stimulate it. So it's going to cause the release of thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone has a whole bunch of functions in the body, right? It's, it's another hormone that its target is everywhere. Right? And it causes the basal metabolic rate to go up, causes the cells to do work. But we don't want the cells to keep working, keep working, keep working, keep working. So the more thyroid hormone you make, I'm going to inhibit TRH and TSH. And if I inhibit by decreasing the amount of TRH, what happens to the amount of TSH? It also goes down. And what happens if I decrease the amount of TSH? What happens to the amount of thyroid hormone? Thyroid hormone. hormone also goes down. This is classic negative feedback. Okay? And a lot of the hormones are actually regulated by negative feedback like this. Okay, testosterone is, thyroid hormone is, growth hormone is. Okay. So we're going to change, and we're going to talk about kind of what we were, you know, we were just mentioned about how do they, like, how long do they last? How do they do their job? All right. There are two major classes of hormone species. Okay. The hydrophobic and the hydrophobic. Hydrophobic means what? A rate of water, which are usually what type of, what type of uh, molecule? Yeah, lipids, fat. Okay. Okay. And hydrophilic are water soluble. We'll talk about those in a second. Let's deal with the hydrophobic first. Okay, hydrophobic hormone. Okay, and you have to it's sort of like the hypophobic has a feed system. So I'm going to pass it into you. There's hundreds of flies on it. Okay, there's not really hundreds. There's a lot of them because it's a super, super important concept that we're going to take through the entire semester. Hydrophobic hormones are water insoluble, which means they're lipid soluble. Those are interchangeable. When I ask you. I'm quizzing some exams and I say, tell me about the hydrophobic hormone. And you say, hydrophobic means they don't like water. I'm going to be like, that's not an answer. Because hydrophobic by definition means it doesn't like water. Yeah. I need you to tell me something more. So these are all interchangeable. Hydrophobic, lipid soluble, water, insolu water soluble, water insoluble. Because they're all the same statement. Okay, you don't get to give it to me three times the same sentence. Okay. Now, the only substances that we really deal with that are lipid soluble are lipids themselves. So hydrophobic hormones, by definition, for our purposes, are always derived from a lipid, and a specific type of lipid called cholesterol. Okay, so when your doctor says, get the cholesterol down, you can say, hey, I need it. Because I need to make hormones. Okay, we call them hormones steroids. What's the good cholesterol? Um, good question on HDL, and that's not what we're talking about here. Yeah, so let's, let's take a brief aside. LDL, HDL, right? <coughs> high density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, is a form of cholesterol. It's the second person who walked in, right? Okay. <laughs> that's the form of cholesterol that, that's in the blood, right? And the density lipoprotein refers to, we're going to learn that the liver produces most of the plasma protein mm -hmm. in the blood. The transport proteins, so LDL and HDL are the transport carriers for cholesterol elsewhere in the body. Cholesterol is used in a lot of places. What's another place you already know cholesterol is used? So that's right, like right, like fluidity of it. All right here we have another use of cholesterol. Okay, separate from all of that. Okay, so <clears throat> derived from cholesterol. All right, so we use cholesterol. You can see a lovely drawing of cholesterol, and all of our steroid hormones. Okay, all of our steroid hormones are derived, start with cholesterol. And basically, we just start chopping little pieces off and adding little pieces on. So you can see that the cholesterol backbone always stays pretty much the same. Right? So you always see kind of these rings in our substances. Notice also that what happens here is, is that from cholesterol, the first step in the synthetic pathway is to turn cholesterol into progesterone. And from progesterone, we can either get testosterone, right, or we can change it slightly differently and get cortisol, right, which we were just talking about with CRH, or we can change it just a little bit differently and get aldosterone, right, which helps regulate urine volume and electrolyte balance. If we go the testosterone route, we can modify it further and get estrogen or estradiol. 
All right, so note that as we make these hormones, we're passing through other hormones. So, does everyone make progesterone, male or female? Yes. Because if you don't make progesterone, you can't make anything else. Cortisol. Yeah, aldosterone, you can't make anything. So, understand that when we say that testosterone is a male hormone and progesterone is a female hormone, we're talking about a, like, a battle. We all make moms. It's just that relative amounts of them is slightly different, okay, based upon their function. Now, you do not need to memorize those structures. Okay, not a chemistry class. I'm not going to say which one is this. All right, because again, you do need to recognize the names, though. What do all of those names have? Take a look at their end names. O N E or O L. Okay? Without fail, I cannot think of a single steroid hormone that does not end in O N E or O L. Okay, so that's a good way to know that it's a steroid, which means it's lipid soluble, the hydrophobic hormone. Okay, it's the O N E and the O L. Even estrogen is really called estradiol. Okay, we don't even call it estrogen. Question. So females, wouldn't you have to have as much testosterone as you would in order to get that? Not necessarily, because if I have more of the enzyme that converts testosterone to estradiol, then I would have less of this as, as a result. Yeah, that's a good question. I would also, if you counted how many molecules I made in, any, like in my lifetime, yeah. But I don't see it in testosterone. I keep moving on. Yeah. Um, uh, the process for the female, Right, and why it's a male woman, right? Yes. Yeah, and then uh, sometimes, you know, they can get more balanced, right? Yes. So what causes the uh, hormone balance? There's lots of reasons. The whole, uh, disorders of the, of the endocrine system mm -hmm. can be the result either of a change of the synthetic pathway. Which one's that? Change in the synthetic pathway. Because remember that each one of these arrows represents at least one step and five. And enzymes catalyze reactions. If I have an enzyme dysfunction, malfunction, like I have a genetic disorder that doesn't let me make the enzyme that converts progesterone to testosterone, then I won't be able to make as much testosterone. So this because of enzyme? It could be. It doesn't have to be because let's say I make plenty of testosterone, but I don't make any testosterone receptor. Mm -hmm. What's the problem there? Someone's shouting, hey, 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 and what am I? Not listening. All right, I got my ear filmed in. I'm, all right, I'm just doing my own thing because I can't hear. Because without the receptor, I can have as much. Diabetes is a really good example of that, mm -hmm. where you make plenty of insulin, but you don't have the insulin receptor, or your insulin receptors are insensitive. Is there a name for these different steps? Or do we need to no. Yeah. No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't even have to know which order you go in. Okay, this is a demonstration slide showing you the backbone of cholesterol. Okay, because to understand the hydrophobic hormones, the next step is how do they work? What is their mechanism of action? Okay, that's the next step. So if they're hydrophobic, all right, and we know they're released into the blood. If they're hydrophobic and they're released into the blood, and then here's a potential target. My target. And here's the hormone. How are they going to tell this cell to do something? Yeah, receptors. Where do you think I'm going to put the receptor? Receptors are always protein, by the way. What's this hormone, by the way? The steroid. How do you What type of what type of molecule is it? I right, put it in one of my four groups. Let me remind you of four groups. Proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. Which one is this? Lipids. 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 All right, this is a protein. You have to make sure you understand that. So here we have a nice little lipid floating around in the interstitial space. The receptors are protein. Proteins are generally what? Hydrophobic or hydrophobic? Hydrophobic. Alright, protein reading was soluble in water. Right, they hang out in the water. So, how am I going to get this cell to do its job? Where am I going to put the receptor? Okay, if I put the receptor out here, 
and add their brown together. How is this cell going to know what to do? The receptor is way up here. What happens if the receptor goes this way? Nothing happens. <laughs> okay, so this is not going to work. We're not going to put it outside. We never actually put receptors not extra cells. Okay. This is a lipid. What's this membrane made out of? Primarily. It is also a lipid, right? The lipid bilayer. So if this little hormone comes up and hits it, what's it going to do? It's going to get in. Because what this is made out of? Lipid. What's this made out of? Lipid. What do lipids like? Look at it. So it's just going to say, hello. <laughs> and it's going to move right on in. By diffusion. What type of diffusion do we call this, where all of that is moving against what are moves with its gradient? Yeah, simple diffuse. It's going to simply diffuse in the cell. Home concentrations high up here, which it would be considered blood. Long concentrations high up here, this hormone is going to move away from high concentration to low concentration. And this certainly isn't making it, so it's going to just diffuse right on in. So where am I going to put my receptor? Inside. What do we call that? Inside. What's the word? Intracellular. So we have instant lipid hormones, the hydrophobic hormones, use intracellular receptors. So now you have a receptor that's activated. Now, if it's inside the cell, guess who it can get really close to? The nucleus. The nucleus. Who's in the nucleus? The DNA. DNA. Why do we care about DNA for this purpose? What? Gene expression. Right? Gene expression. Gene expression means what? What am I making? What does gene expression mean? I make what? Proteins. And what do proteins do? They protein themselves to replicate. They could tell the cell to replicate, right? So certainly I could say, hey, make a protein that causes the cell to go through mitosis. That can happen. Estrogen does that. Estrogen is a mitotic stimulant for breast and uterus cells, among others. Right? What else could this protein do that I'm making if it was a different protein? What else could it do? You don't need to give me specifics. No. I want to I just have to watch. Growth. Sex. Movement. Transport. Make something. Destroy something. What else? Prepare something. Specialize. Become something cool. Right? I can just keep on going. What can we love all of this stuff into? Four letter word. Work. Proteins do work. Everything you think about a cell doing is almost 99.9999% of the result of protein action. Why do we care about proteins? And why do we undergo like homeostasis in the first place? You do homeostasis because if you don't, proteins unfold. And if protein, proteins unfold, what happens? They can't work, and the cells die, and you get sick. So the steroid hormone, almost universally, because they can actually get inside the cell, this protein almost always travels to the nucleus and causes new gene expression. And then depending on what hormone that is, what cell type this is, what receptor it is, because there's lots of varieties, then the results, the work, can be very, very different. It can be super, super different. Now, how long do you think it takes me to find my receptor, get into the nucleus, because this is all by diffusion, right? It's just based on, based on concentration. It's not like someone's going to pick you up and say, hey, you're an activated receptor, come with me. Right? So it's not quite that directive. They find the DNA, find the appropriate piece of DNA, make RNA, make protein, and the protein finally does its work. You think on the grand scale, that's fast or slow? Slow. slow. And in fact, the hydrophobic hormones, remember we've been talking about this continuum, 
where the nervous system is the fastest, right, because it's electrical and it's chemical directly, local, paraprint, and then the endocrine system is slow. This is the slowest of the slow. Okay, this is going to be the slowest of the slow. Now, this hormone, this steroid hormone, it's secreted into the, because it's a hormone, blood. The blood is primarily made out of what? Water. So, this is a, what type of hormone? A trophic. It's being secreted into water. What's the problem? It doesn't want to do it. So, what do I need to do to that hormone? To make it work in the blood. To make, not work, let me use a different word. To make it soluble, to make it be able to be transported in the blood. So that when I give blood and they're looking for, you know, estrogen levels, right, they don't see little, little blobs of fat. <clears throat> right? Have you ever seen that? When you give blood, do you ever see little blobs of fat? Most people? <laughs> no. How do we make this able to be transported in the blood? Gotta have a special carrier. Thank you. A special carrier protein. Because that's going to make it work. We call those binding proteins. And if you read through the, the PowerPoint, you see the good cell for the PowerPoint. So we bind my hydrophobic hormone to binding protein. Who do you think makes binding protein? Did anyone catch it? I could. Said something about this in a minute. We're talking about LDL and ACL. Who makes most of my plasma protein? Most high protein sound of the blood? The liver? The liver. And the liver is important in a lot of systems. Here you can see why it would be important endocrine. So you have your binding protein bound to your hormone for transport in the blood. That's a trick. We sometimes call these transport proteins. All right, transport proteins. Transport proteins do exactly what they say. They transport things around. And in this case, they're transporting hydrophobic hormones around. Now, the, thing, the reason I'm mentioning this is because we're talking about this continuum. Right? Is that these hormones that are bound to their transport protein, they're going everywhere in the blood, correct? Right? Which means that they're probably going through the kidneys. Agree? Right? About 20% of your blood supply for every heartbeat at rest goes through the kidneys. Okay? For every heartbeat, about 20% goes through the kidneys for filtration. When you have a hormone bound to a transport protein, right, it's very hard because it's so big for the kidneys to clear. So this type of protein, the steroid hormone, has a longer half-life. Because not only can they not be cleared by the kidney, they clear these removed, right? The kidneys remove substances from the blood and throw them away in teeth. Right? So they have a longer half-life. Not only because the kidneys don't clear them very well, but also because there's lots of enzymes and proteins that are basically helping keep hormone levels in check. So any time they find a free hormone, they destroy it. They figure if you really not want it, make more. To create more. If you really try to get a message out, don't talk like that. <laughs> right, talk like this. Make it loud and proud. So if you have a steroid hormone down to its transport protein, how well can those enzymes see that hormone? Do you think? The hormone, not the protein, the hormone. Not very well, right? Because they're surrounded by the transport protein. So here, again, into this continuum idea of hormones, like endocrine system, is slow, but this is the slowest of the slow. Because of a number of reasons. One, because what's its mechanism of action? It has to diffuse into the cell, find its receptor, get it to the nucleus, find the right piece of DNA, make RNA, make protein, and then the protein doesn't work. Right? Slow. That's one major reason, because it's a mechanism of action. A second reason is because it's bound to transport protein, so it can't be cleared by the kidney. So it stays around longer. 
A third reason, it can't get destroyed as easily because it's bound to a transport protein. So the half-life of the hydrophobic hormones is much greater than of the other class that we're going to look at in just a second. Does that make sense? And all of this information is in the PowerPoint, so don't get so if you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. It is there. Hopefully you guys got this. Okay, are there any questions on that? The idea here is, is that when you go into the kidney and the blood supply, right, if I, the kidney can't clear you, that means it doesn't get you in the blood. It doesn't get stuck in the kidney. No, 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 that's not what we're talking about. If I, the kidneys don't remove you, for our purposes, if you say the kidneys don't clear, the kidneys don't remove you, then that means I must be left where? In the blood, right? Because the whole purpose of the kidney is taking out of the blood. If they don't do that, then it means it's in the blood. Which means that the half-life, right? What's half-life defined as? Just a little quick sense. The amount of time it takes for a patient to drop by half, right? We don't have half-life. All right. A longer half-life means that it's around longer. There's more of it around for a longer amount. So the steroids, the hydrophobic hormones, are the are the short, slowest of the slow, and the most persistent. Right? Remember those ideas of how long does the effect last, but also, right, how long does it take to happen? Right? This is the slowest of the slow. That's why the, part of the reason the endocrine system is so long term. Note these hormones, progesterone, tes testosterone, and estrogen. What's one effect that they have on the body at about age 12? <laughs> puberty. How long does it take to go through puberty? Years. Years. Right, and how long do we maintain the effects of puberty? Lifetime. Lifetime. Right? Cortisol. This is that stress. Right? Long term stress. And aldosterone is about urine formation. We'll talk a lot about that when we get to it. Okay. If we have our high 
hydrophobic hormone, then we also must have our hydrophilic. Okay, our hydrophilic are derived from amino acids. All right, now they can be either single amino acids, which we would call mono, which means one. Mono means sometimes called catecholamines, sometimes called biogenic amines. So they, those, they all have the word amine, and I usually call them mono because they tell me that's what they are. Right? They can either be mono amines, or what is our other word for, I'm going to make up a word here, polyamine. We don't ever use that term. We've probably never heard that term before. What is a bunch of amino acids linked together? Polypeptide or, when it's really big, no, it's separate it's sugar. What is it? Protein. <laughs> so you can either be single amino acids, you can be a few amino acids, 10, 15, 20, all right, and you could call yourself a polypeptide, or you could be 200 and I'm a protein. But I'm still always made from what? Amino acids. If you're made from an amino acid, with one exception, which we'll talk about in a second, you are considered hydrophilic. Because most of our proteins, and certainly most of our amino acids, are hydrophilic. And that means water-loving, lipid-hating. Okay, that's the, that's the follow-through there. So here we're talking about polypeptides, which are small proteins and proteins. You can use those terms interchangeably. Okay, it's an arbitrary distinction. Anything less than 200 amino acids is considered a polypeptide. More than 200 amino acids is considered a protein. I don't care. I usually call them proteins. Okay, if it's two amino acids, I usually call it a protein. Okay, if it's a single amino acid, though, I will always call it a monoamine. And you can just kind of see here's oxytocin. You can see it's nine amino acids, nine amino acids. Here's insulin, right? You can see it's closer to, I think, like, I don't know, 24 or something like that. All right, the single, um, we'll see on the other slide, the single amino acids. <clears throat> now, regardless of whether or not you're a single amino acid, a poly, or a protein, regardless, you're hydrophilic. Which means that, given our drawing over there, all right, I'm hydrophilic. I'm secreted into the blood. Do I need any help? No, because what am I? What do I like? Water. What am I being secreted into? Water. Any problem? Water and water? Perfect. So, am I clear by the kidney relatively quickly? Because I'm pretty small. Yeah. Can those little enzymes that are cleaning up random hormones, can they get me? Yeah. Because what protected the steroids? Not the lipid. What protected the steroids? The transport protein. The binding protein. Do I need a binding protein? Can I have one if I want one? No. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> I don't need one. I don't get one. Your body's very efficient that way. I don't need it. I don't get it. So when I tap through the kidney, the kidney is like taking it out. So you need a lot of it. It also means that how long does my effect, like how long am I around? What's my half life? Short. Really short, comparatively, anyway. And those enzymes are constantly, are constantly eating me, keeping my levels low, unless you're going to make more of me. Now, let's imagine that I make it through the gauntlet, and I make it to my target. There's enough of me to cause an effect. And I'm like, hallelujah! <laughs> I get my target. And what's the thing I encounter on outside of the cell? <laughs> the lipid body layer. Uh, really? What's the problem? <laughs> what am I? I like water. I, I like water. What's the lipid? Fat. Fat. Am I like, hey, how are you? Can I do anything? No. Now, where am I going to put my receptor then? On the outside. Okay. Let's, let's think about that for just a second. We know it's not going to be on the inside. We can walk. I can't get it. Get it. Okay, good. If I put it extracellularly, outside, totally outside, I bind to it, great. But then how do we get in? It's the same problem, right? Remember, we didn't put the receptor outside because I couldn't get in. So it's in the body layer. What do we call that? Or channel. Membrane bound receptor. I find it in the membrane. I put it in the membrane, which means it's always at the target. 
right? Never going to wander off. And what that does for me, and here's my cell, and then here's my receptor, okay, it is transmembrane specifically. What's that mean, transmembrane? You see parts of it on the outside and parts of it on the inside. So when my hormone comes around and binds to this receptor, this receptor changes shape. And it changes shape right, in such a way that it can cause something to happen inside. Now, here's my nucleus. Is this receptor going to get up and walk in its little fuzzy little jeans over here and walk over here? No, because it's by definition membrane bowel. <clears throat> so how is it going to get its information? Does it, it's not really even going to talk to the nucleus. It's going to talk to the nucleus. We've got that covered. Yeah, well, it, we could try to take it in, and some hormones do that, but for our purposes, we just need to get the message in. We use what are known as second messages. With this being considered my first. Right? That's why we call it second. Now, second messengers are small intra, which means what? Inside. Inside. Small intracellular signal molecules. A good analogy of this is this. I go to the bar, I go to Tempe, and I know I do not like my age, so I get carded all the time. <laughs> and I go up and I don't have my age. Right? And if I don't have my ID, if the bouncer is good, what's he going to say? Sorry, yeah. I'm 21 and old. Yeah. <laughs> he's not going to give me a wristband. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> right. He's going to be like, sorry. I'll be like, but my friends are inside. It's before cell phones. All right. My friends are inside. I bet he's going to go find them. And he's like, no. Right. Sorry. But I'm like, oh, but they have my keys. Or I don't know. You know, trying to get my way in. And he's simply like, no, no, no. I'm stuck outside. And you all are having a fantastic time inside. Right? How am I going to get a message to you? Is the bouncer going to leave? Is he going to get up, go in, and carry my message for me? No. no. Because as soon as he walks away, I'm inside. <laughs> okay, that's like how I roll. But, <laughs> but what could he do? He's not going to leave. He's not letting me in. He gets someone else. And he hands the message to him and he says, hey, you, go deliver this message and get a response. That's the second messenger. It's like the inside person. Okay? So the second messenger causes a response. And this response uses existing proteins. So we still got to do work. Right? And work is protein. But it takes proteins that are already there. No nucleus, no naked new crap. Just use what's already there and get your response. So in the grand scheme of things, is this going to be quicker than that? Yeah, so because so I have to go to the nucleus. So I have to find the DNA. So I have to make RNA. So I have to make protein and then get my job done. No, I already have my protein. So my hydrophilic hormones use existing metabolic proteins, existing proteins to get their job done. And they tell the existing proteins what to do with second messengers, with these additional little helpers. And it's a major difference. One last topic, and I know I'm running out of time. The exception. The monoamine hormone, thyroid hormone, is a monoamine. Okay? But it is hydrophobic, which means what's its receptor type? Hydrophobic. It's not lipid, though. Keep in mind, right? It's not lipid. It's amino acid. But it acts like a hydrophobic. So what's its receptor? Intracellular or membrane bound? Intracellular. Does it talk to the nucleus or does it use existing? No. <laughs> talk to the nucleus. There's two questions there. Okay. Talk to the nucleus. It acts exactly like the steroid, but it's not. It's the one exception, thyroid hormone. So when you go through the review questions, and you should be able to answer them all now, when you go through the review questions, it says, what's unique about thyroid hormone? What's unique about thyroid hormone? It's a monoamine, but it's hydrophobic, and it acts like a hydrophobic. It's just a weird one. Yeah, it has to do with how it's made. Yeah. 
So here you can see we just talked about all these. We talked about hormones. We talked about the receptors, modes of action, right? Here's some examples. 